I've just pulled up where I'm going to be fishing today on the River Don in Sheffield and it's a really bleak Yorkshire day it's grey, rainy the trees are bare large blocks of flats to my right uh, playing fields on my left with the swings and the slides and there's the hum of factories over one side and the flats on the other there's quite a few songbirds actually for a park normally often in parks it's just magpies and crows but there's a few uh, few songbirds cheeping away the species we're after today is grayling um, it is January we are in winter and um, it holds a fair few grayling the Don hundreds of years ago it was a prolific salmon river and then as uh, the river was dammed to provide power for the, the mills and the, the, the small enterprises along the river it obstructed it so the salmon couldn't run as well and then as we moved into the industrial revolution we got all the massive heavy industry that Sheffield's renowned for the steelworks and brickworks and they polluted it really badly and, and, and it was really a dead river in fact there used to be a saying many many years ago in Sheffield if you fell in the Don you'd be poisoned before you'd drown I think that just gives an idea of how bad it was the smell of a baking in the air I wonder if there's a, must be a bread baker's or a, someone's baking something nearby smell give me an appetite so I'm going to squeeze my way through the little gap in this fence uh, head down to the river and we're more or less down so it's amazing when you're down you are like in another world um, away from the industry and here is a beautiful river in front of me a couple of ducks just making their way across to the far bank now they've seen me um, on the right hand side there's a large angry looking fence with a factory behind it obviously they don't want people getting in or out on the left bank is the little bramble thicket and the river upstream in front of me there seems to be a bit of a flood defence that's been built here um, it's one of these flood defences with them. Um, like a, a cage of wire and inside the cage um, there's bricks and rubble that's been poured in and the cage has the sharp bits of wire still sticking off and uh, I can imagine myself um, tearing the old waders on that one so I'm going to have to watch out this looks a nice little run to start off with there's quite slack water um, next to the flood defence the river's about 20 feet wide here and then moving up the river uh, it speeds up and I can see there's a, a nice bubbled stream and a little uh, head of the pool, um, there's a riffle there, uh, a few stray branches that have stuck in the rocks. Um, but that looks a nice little run, so I'm going to set up and um, we'll see how we get on. Okay, we're all set up and ready to go. Um, I'll just go quickly through the setup I'm using. I'm check nymphing today, um, which is a great technique for grayling. Uh, I've got a 10 foot 4 weight rod, um, about 9 feet of fluorocarbon, not bothering with a tapered leader, there's no need to today on the leader. I've got one dropper on so I'm going to fish with two flies, one on the point and one on the dropper. And I've got a, uh, a check tan bug which is a great impression of the shrimp or caddis larva. And then on the dropper I've got an orange check nymph just for a bit of colour, something a bit different, a bit of attraction. Very little line on the surface of the water only about eight or nine inches of fly line and we just toss the flies up and let them trundle down the bottom so I'm just working the channel and then every cast or two taking a, um, a pace upstream let's move up a bit now there's not really a fly cast at all when you check an infant it's more of a an overhand lob and um, you're using the weight of the flies to propel the cast as opposed to the the flex of the rod if that makes sense but the secret is to have very little fly line on the water because you don't want any drag if you get drag and the line starts bowing across the surface then you will um, you'll raise the nymphs up and the idea here with these flies is to get the flies as deep as possible the grayling more likely to be feeding deep. What I've done is greased up the uh, the end of the fly line with some silicon grease. Ooh, I thought that was a little bite then, but 
maybe not, maybe just caught on the bottom. Um, and what I'm looking for is that little 89 inches of fly line stopping or shooting away or dipping down um, instead of flowing down with the river. And if it does shoot away or stop or dip down, then I'll strike. And I'll, I'll strike every little possible take. These grayling are incredibly quick. And um, if you're not quick, they can... Ooh, stopped again then but I think it was probably just caught on a rock but I I struck anyway the, the, the beauty of these 10 foot rods is you just get that little bit of extra reach when you check nymphing that um, that allows you to cover that bit more water the water's fairly slack here and it looks about 4 or 5 foot deep in the middle but it's it's probably a touch on the slow side for the check nymphing but I prefer to be uh, check nymphing in that faster water where the, the fish don't have any uh, time to make their decision whether they're going to take your fly or not and um, they grab it before them before they know it you, you're striking you into them when in this in this slower water oh just get over these slippery walks in this slower water sometimes the fish have got a little bit more time to um, examine what's coming past them. Oh, that's moved again there. Now I can see that's caught on a rock because there's a little bit of slime on the check nymph. The boulders here are fairly, uh, almost like an upland river really, that a bit round and a bit slimy and a bit slippy. And um, if you catch one, you can often tell you've caught one because you get you pick up a bit of that slime on the flies. Oh, the rain's held off a little bit anyway. Oh, that looked like a take actually. Put it back again in that little section. The bit of water I'm most interested in is coming up now. It's a, the bit I'm in now is the kind of deeper, slower glide of the pool. And um, the bit I'm interested in is where I can see the white bubble stream coming down river and then the, the faster, quicker water at the top. And, and that's where I'm hoping there'll be a grayling or two. So looking upstream, there's a, the river's lovely and tree-lined actually. Some big old trees on both sides and still got the, the big grey factories on the right-hand bank. On the left-hand bank there's a little little thicket of planted trees. It looks like the council have tried to plant a few trees. and But it's all pretty bare and grey at this time of year. It's Well, any river is even the most beautiful piece of river at this time of year has a kind of barren feeling about it. It's just a pleasure to see there's a fish back in here. I'm going to move up a little bit more. Rock's a bit unstable there. I'm going to have to watch my footing. It's not too cold, actually. Once you're down here and you, this method of fishing is incredibly active, you're casting every few seconds and walking and moving, so you um, you tend to feel the cold in your fingertips. They normally go first and then your toes, but provided you've got some uh, nice thermals on and you're well wrapped up, plenty of layers, then you, um, you tend to stay nice and warm. This is a bit tricky, let's see if you can hear them. I'm going to scrabble through a bit of a bush as I move upstream. I'm concentrating like a hawk on the end of the line. and It should be coming down at the same pace as the river. It's all the little white bubbles on the river. And then an odd leaf and stuff that's coming down with the current. Your line should be moving the same pace. And if it slows or stops, it means that something has stopped the fly. You know? Most of the time, what's stopped the fly is going to be the bottom or a snag. But every so often, it's a fish. And as long as you strike every little stop of the line, you'll, you'll be surprised at how many um, fish you'll catch using this method. I've never fished this um, section of river before, so I don't actually know what's in here. I, I know there's plenty of grayling in here, but... I'm not, um, I'm not familiar with the, the likely holding spots at this time of year. 
kind of being defeated by a bush here as I'm wrestling with it, trying to um, get upstream. But this 10 foot rod's getting out there and doing the job for me. Well, I'm moving, I'm into the head of the pool now. So there's a, you can see where there's, there's like a fork in the river um, at the top of the pool caused by some rocks and then there's a channel that's running in each side. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get across to the other channel, but I can certainly fish this near channel here. And this is where I would hope to, um, there would be grayling or two lying. But as yet, we've not had any joy. Right, I'm right at the head of the pool now, into this quicker water. Um, obviously this is also going to be shallower. And um, not having much luck. Just these rocks are quite green now with moss and you don't know whether when you step on these green rocks whether they're going to be slippy or um, actually help you grip and this moss is a, is helping me in the these studded wading boots it's a lot better than the bare rocks they're a lot slippier might just try and sneak a cast across river as well towards these uh, there's a steep bank on the other side with lots of brambles and top of the brambles is a a, uh, a wall with a large fence on it and behind the fence are some grey factory buildings oh that looked a bit uh, that went away quite sharply, actually, the line there. So I wonder if that was a something having a nibble. Or it might have just been the current. Just put a few casts in this shallow bit here. But no, nothing there. So I'm going to continue walking. I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to, have to get in now, actually. Which looks like it's going to be a bit of an adventure. Uh, there's a, Over the other side there, there's a little outflow from one of the factories. Obviously, they're putting some clean water back in or it's a drain it's a, it looks like it's got a, one of those drains that's got a um, flap on it so when you get a, a, a torrent of water coming through it forces the flap open but the, uh, the flap is closed at the minute so I'm in the river now and uh, it's pretty tricky wading actually these boulders are fairly slippy and um, I'm just going to have to watch my footing. Whoop. <laughs> Nearly went in. Right, we're at the bottom of another run here. About medium paced water. Again, large overhanging trees on the left and the, the factories there still humming away on the right hand side. Uh, I'm going to check me for my way up this section. Looks like the bottom's fairly rocky. of my head I'm thinking that this bit here would be more suitable for fishing an upstream nymph but um, I've not got long today so I think that we'll we'll stick with the check nymph and instead of chopping and changing the the flies interesting with the uh, the grayling here in this river in the Don they were actually introduced because the Don was a dead river as I mentioned due to all the industry polluting it um, but as that industry died away the um, locals noticed that there was coarse fish starting to appear um, obviously they'd come out some of the fishing ponds adjacent to the river but normally they would have uh, died as soon as they got in the river due to the uh, the pollution but there were locals were noticing that the coarse fish were starting to survive um, and as the, as the industry all died away and the water got a lot cleaner the trout returned and further up the river um, it was decided to try and introduce a few more few grayling and this is miles upstream probably 10 50 miles up river and um, they introduced I think it was only 200 fish and um, they bred beautifully now and the the whole river right down through Sheffield city centre is teeming with grayling. <laughs> Apart from this bit, it seems, because I haven't had a, a sniff on this check nymph yet. That's all part of 
winter fishing, you know, you and my foot's gone down a bit of a hole there. Um this winter fishing is hit and miss and you just find a a pocket of fish then you know you can come out for an hour oh that looked like a take that looked like a take pop it back in there um, if you find a pocket of fish then you know you can come out for an hour and have you know four or five fish or you can quite easily come out for a day in winter and have none um, as, oh, I'm in the tree. There we go. Looking at the pool that I was about to fish. Uh, take my eye off the tree for one second and uh, we've slung it in the tree, but luckily the branch is dead and I've pulled the fly off and um, it's brought two inches of branch with it, but looks like it should be able to get this back okay. And again, I'm approaching what is the head of the pool, so we're into the more riffly quicker water. Um, on my left is a big uh, old tree root and it's been undercut by the the current and um, it looks like a very deep hole underneath it. I imagine that's a a lair for a fish or two, probably not now, but if there's any uh, chub or perch in here then you can imagine them lurking under there. How deep is it going to go? Up to my thighs now, which is fine. Oh, a bit deeper. But um, the issue is the rock. The rocks are very slippy. Oh, it's not too bad. Just up to my thighs, and I'll struggle past this big root. Oh, it's a big old root. It must be 10, 15 feet high, and the little undercut pool underneath it is. It's a good four or five feet deep. But we're through that bit now. And this bit of water ahead looks fairly shallow actually. I don't know how well it's going to respond to a Czech nymph. Problem with trying to walk up the river and cast at the same time when you're Czech nymphing is you need to be looking at the fly line the whole time to see whether you've had a take but when you're looking at the fly line you're not looking at where you're wading and it's easy to to put a foot down the hole or slip on a rock. So what I tend to do is kind of sidestep up the river and just feel my way with my left foot. And that way you can just tentatively hopefully work up the river without too many disasters and keep your eyes on that fly line at all times. Uh, it's picked up pace now, the river, and the, uh, we've still got trees on both sides, and yeah, this looks a bit quick, a bit quick and shallow, but we'll work our way up and through. It looks like far ahead up the top, there's a very fast riffle that opens up into a pool, so that might be a good place to try, but we'll, we'll work our way up through this piece of water here. I'm surprised actually how, how little rubbish there is down here. Maybe it's because the river's fenced off at both sides. People haven't been able to get down and deposit their rubbish. But it's, uh, I mean, it's as clean as any river really. Big shelf of a flat slippy rock there and my wading boot won't get a purchase on it but Oh, that was definitely a take, and the fish was on. Ah, it was on for two or three seconds, and then it um, bumped off. Interesting, I wasn't expecting anything in this water, and there you go, just shows you. <laughs> Not quick enough, David. You have to be so quick with these... Uh, these graylings sometimes. Oh, never mind. So obviously we're after grayling today, but there's there's chance of an out-of-season trout. 
and um, anything else which is lurking in here. In fact, that's becoming more and more popular now. One of the most exciting things I think has happened to fly fishing for a long time is the the new wave of anglers that are targeting lots of different species on the fly. And it used to be that fly fishing was for trout and salmon, and everything else was everything else was caught um, in coarse fishing with with bait. But now there's a, and there's, there's a definite dividing line between the two, and it wasn't to be crossed. But that's all gone now, and it's lovely to um, be targeting different species. I really enjoy fishing for carp and perch and pike on the fly, and roach in the summer as well. Roach are fantastic off the top on tiny little dry flies, and of course saltwater fly fishing was huge in the states, but uh, it's starting to, to take off a little bit more here with people fishing for. Pollock and sea bass and even mackerel if off the boat if you can get out to them. But it's all good fun. Ah, snagged again, but it's it's come off. I'll just check the flies and that dropper's a bit tangled, so untangle it. The flies are looking good. And as I wade up, what I'm gonna keep my eye out for is a little opening on the left hand bank where I plan to get out. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm fenced into the river. Let me try and get this snag free again. And this one, Polly. Oh, it's come, and we have. We've lost the fly. Right, time to tackle back up. Okay, what I've done is took a decision as I lost my check nymphs to. Um, I had to retie on another fly anyway, so I've put on instead of the check nymph and set up a little olive pupa, size 16, with a, a small tungsten bead. And I'm going to fish this as a, an upstream nymph. Um, so I'm casting upstream, I'm casting out probably 10 15 feet of line, not a great deal. And then uh, just gathering the slack as the, uh, as the line com comes back down the river. And what I'm looking for is again the end of the line shooting away as a fish takes the uh, nymph. I also took the opportunity while the line was out of the water to apply some more grease to the end to just keep the end of that line floating nice and high on the water. I want to try a bit of a, um, a roll cast actually so I can get out across towards the other bank towards where the factory's, uh, factory fence is. And we are in. What have we got here? And it's off. <sighs> I think that was a little brown trout. Um, in which case I'm happy for it to come off because they're out of season at the minute. But that's instant results on the, uh, on the upstream nymph. In fact, the roll cast is quite nice here because I can fish nice and short range and this 10 foot rod is just giving me the uh, the ability to roll cast out to, towards the other bank and cover more water than the check nymph. There's a ducks up ahead. Of course we're not far off from that time of year where the, uh, the ducks start to mate and I'm spending a lot of time on the river. It's a, it's a brutal sight. You really do feel sorry for the uh, for the female ducks, but uh, that's the way it is. All right, I'm edging up now. It's quite nice here because it's completely hidden. You wouldn't know you were in a semi-urban um, area of Sheffield. Certainly, the the banks are high and steep and lined with trees and. The river's coming down at a nice pace. I imagine this is going to be a cracking spot for dry fly in the in the spring. Perfect pace of water for fishing dry fly. Right, edge up a bit further. We're approaching the we're about midway up the pool here now. Uh, the uh, fast riffly water is about 50 or 60 feet ahead of me. I'm just going to keep fishing up. 
casting, watching this line come down. There's a big fallen tree here that's come down in the wind and as they do, they've gathered all the, uh, the trees gathered all the litter and rubbish that's come down in the high water and it's all collected the bottom, the plastic bags and bottles and crisp packets. So I'm using the roll cast here to just tap the line out. So it's very short range nymphing but it's giving me control over the line on the water um, and also I'm spending most of the the time with my fly in the water instead of false casting. Uh, I think a lot of people false cast too much and um, they, if you think about it, over the course of a session, you know, they could be spending, in a four hour session, they could be spending an hour with their fly in the air. Um, I like to maximise the time that my fly is in the water just to give me every chance to put it in front of a fish's nose but apart from that little suspected brownie that we lost I'm not getting very much luck right, let's try a bit of a, a longer cast and I'll put one out into the middle of the stream Really let that tungsten nymph get down. Oh, that moved away a bit there. I'm fishing right in the middle of the stream now. But it doesn't look particularly deep actually, it only looks, I can see the rocks, so it's probably only two or three feet deep. And uh, I think sometimes. It, this time of year the grayling in this colder water retreat to the deeper pools but we'll see All right, I'm going to ease my way upstream again a bit of a there's a table leg here stuck out the river you find all sorts of interesting things in these urban rivers mustn't forget to um, to get out. There's only one spot I can get out the river upstream uh, through a gap in the fence and if, I, if I'm not careful I'm going to miss it and uh, I'll be stuck in the river <laughs> looking for a spot to get out. But it is nice here because it's, although you're next to a park and the industry and the factories, you, you're just hidden away and I'm not convinced that this tungsten nymph is getting down, actually. You really want your your nymph to be down near the bottom during the grayling fishing in the winter, where the fish are going to be feeding. They're not really going to be coming up, so... It's no good expecting your the fish to come to your fly. You've got to take your fly to the fish. I'm having to get in a bit deeper as you can probably hear I'm up to my thighs again now but the water's not too cold and I've got these waders uh, fleece lined and neoprene so they're, they're pretty warm alright I think we're nearly done for today I'm uh, I don't think it's to be that's the way it goes. Still, it's been a beautiful morning to be out. It's lovely to be just out on the river. I'll definitely come back. Maybe not in the grayling season, but once we're underway for trout in spring, this will be a fantastic piece of water for dry fly fishing. Really well. It's, it's got everything you want, and I know from the, the other sections of the River Don Half Fish, there's there's a decent hatch of a good variety of flies, mayflies, plenty of olives, lots of caddis flies. So I imagine the trout and the grayling in the, 
in the uh, the dry fly months will be fantastic. That's it. We're out. Oh well, lovely morning. One on, which I suspect was a uh, a little wild brownie. Maybe another take or two, but it's hard to tell. Now, I hope you've enjoyed listening. Um, further information: www.peaksflyfishing.com or our fly shop online is shop.peaksflyfishing.com. Get in touch, leave a comment. So always great to hear from people. Goodbye for now.